All right, we're going to continue to talk about chemical kinetics, and we're particularly going to look at rate laws and understanding how we can represent rate laws, and in many cases, understand what those rate laws are. So the learning objectives for this segment, we're going to be able to define what a rate law is, understand the independence of rate laws and the rate order uh, from stoichiometry, and use the method of initial rates to discover what the rate laws are for certain uh, reactions. Okay, so a general rate law, it'll be of the form uh, some chemical reaction, stoichiometric coefficient A, uh, molecule A plus stoichiometric coefficient lower B uh, plus molecule B produces products. But we're not gonna really worry about the products are, usually they don't um, affect the kinetics and um, there could be more species, but let's just start with two. Okay, so a rate equation looks something like this. The rate of disappearance uh, of A is going to be, um, and that that's, should be a T there, that's a, a time, not temperature. Uh, the rate of disappearance of A is uh, frequently proportional to uh, the concentration of A to some power and the concentration of B to some power. And these powers are in many cases integers, they don't have to be, but they, uh, they usually are. And uh, there's some constant proportionality to turn this um, powers of the concentrations into a rate. So that's what we discover is that rates usually look something like this. Now here's an important fact. These factors M and N are not necessar necessarily related to the stoichiometric coefficients A and B at all. Um, because uh, for reasons we'll get into, we talk about chemical, uh, a little more about reaction mechanisms, but they're not necessarily related at all. They uh, have to be discovered independently. And frequently they can be zero. You could have no dependence on one of the reactants and just depend on one reactant. Um, so we have to learn what they are experimentally. Um, so chemical reactions do take place in a lot of steps. The balanced chemical reaction only reports the initial and final state. So frequently the actual kinetics depend on some intermediate state. As I said, we'll talk more about it when we talk about mechanisms. So. Um, the stoichiometric coefficients, talking about the overall reaction, don't necessarily um, relate directly to the mechanism that is actually, uh, the, the mechanistic step that's actually uh, the, the rate limiting step. Okay, so uh, when we talk about a rate law, we classify them in terms of reaction order, and it's the, just the sum of the integers, m plus n, and if there's more um, reactants, then the, the, um, the coefficient in the rate law of that as well. Um, okay. So that's the reaction order. And so for example, if the rate was equal to some constant times the concentration of A, that would be first order. Uh, uh, the rate, if it's proportional to uh, the concentration of A squared, that's second order. Uh, it's also second order if it's, the, if it's the concentration of A times the concentration of B, that is still second order. And if it doesn't depend on the concentration of anything, if it's just equal to a constant, it's zeroth order, since M and N are all zeros. So how do you deter experimentally determine rate laws? Well, a really common way is the method of initial rates. Uh, as you remember that the rate changes throughout the, um, throughout the entire um, uh, reaction. So um, you only really know the concentrations at the very beginning. So what you want to do is apply this method at um, the very beginning and, and calculate the rates over a short time interval at the beginning. So that can be a little challenging, but people have you know, set up a lot of ways to do that. So um, you monitor the change in the initial reaction rate. Again, it's the initial reaction rate because we don't, it's much harder to keep track of how much there is of everything after amount of time uh, as a function of changing the initial concentrations. Uh, of each reactant sequentially. So what you do is you you try a bunch of different amounts of different initial reactions. And then there's a procedure to deduce mathematically the power dependence of each reactant on the overall reaction rate from these relative changes. And then once you have those rates, you can solve for the rate constant. Um, so let's do an example. This is something that's easier, more easy to demonstrate than it is to actually do. So for example, uh, rate uh, is, we just assume a rate law that it's proportional to some reaction constant times the concentration of A to the M, concentration of B to the M. Uh, all right, and we collect this data. Let's start with really easy numbers. You'd generally not uh, be able to start with these numbers. So concentration of A in molarity is one uh, in experiment one. So we have a series of experiments. We need to do, oops, we need to do a series of experiments here. Uh, so this is experiment one. This is experiment two, this is experiment three. And uh, we start the experiment, we measure the initial rate. Remember, this is initial rate, which can be uh, 
measured by looking at the change in concentration of A, uh, time, the, chair, the, the uh, rate of disappearance of, of A. And so now we want to figure out, can we take this information and solve for uh, what M and N are, and then what K is as well. We've got three equations, three unknowns, there should be a way to do it. How do we set that up? Okay, so the standard way to do this is we say, well, rate one over rate two, well, that's going to be the rate constant times A. The uh, A1 is the concentration of A in the first experiment to the M, and then B at one to the N, uh, and we're just using the information for this rate equation. And then the rate of experiment two is going to be K. And now it's A2, it's a different con uh, a concentration, but it's still to the power M because it's still this rate law, same rate law, even though we've changed the concentrations, B2 to the N. All right, so now we start plugging in numbers. Let's look at experiment one and two. Uh, well, first, one thing we can notice is, right, uh, after all, the rate constants cancel out. So we've eliminated one equation. So uh, we can rewrite this as A1 over A2 to the M times B1 over B2 to the N. So let's see in, in uh, experiment one and two. So experiment one and two, uh, A1 is one and A2 is two, but the B is the same in both experiments. So we can uh, cancel this out and that gives us um, one over two to the M. Uh, and now we only have one variable left. And so we can look at the ratio of rates. Well, what's rate one? 0 0.75, and I won't worry about the units because they're the same. So the units will cancel out when we divide it. 0 0.50 equals one half. So now we have the equation, one half to the M is equal to one half. And that's pretty trivial to solve, right? M equals one. So we've solved for what one is, M is equal to one. Okay, now let's move to what other information we have. We have one more experiment we can do. So now let's take a look at rate one over rate three. So again, uh, that will be now, uh, so I can skip this first step. I'll just show that the case cancel out. It'll be of the form A1, A3, the concentration experiment three to the M, uh, times the concentration of B1, uh, B3, the concentration is in experiment three. We're looking at experiment three now to the N. Um, and that is equal to, well, uh, the A's uh, are one. So it actually, we know what M is, but it doesn't really matter because concentration one over concentration one is just one. And so we get that uh, the concentration of B, a one, a concentration in experiment one, B1, that's one, concentration experiment three, is two to the N is equal to 0 0.75. That's the rate, in, initial rate in experiment one, divided by 3.00 equals one fourth. So now we have the equation one half uh, to the N is equal to one fourth. And that's pretty easy. That's just, a, um, we can solve that by inspection, N equals two. So we have that the rate law is K A to the one, B to the two. Uh, and now from that, we, uh, uh, we can plug into one of the other equations and get what K is. So we can look and we can see that this rate is going to be K times one molar. And now we know that this is to the one times one molar squared. And so that would be um, that, uh, let's, let's move this down so we get a little more space. M equals one. Okay, so what we have is that K times one molar cubed is equal to uh, 0.75 molar per second. So we divide both sides by molar to the third and that says K equals 0 0.75 uh, inverse seconds times, uh, let's, let's write the inverse seconds this way, um, seconds to the minus one molar to the minus two. So uh, clearly this does what have, have to be what the rate is because if we multiply um, this uh, seconds to the minus one molar to the minus two times 
three molars, we get molar uh, uh, molar over second, which is what the units are. So you can frequently, if you're given the um, the rate constant, you know what the order is from right there. You might not know whether the squared is on the A or the B, but you can recognize what the order is right away. Uh, so that's a useful thing to know. If you're given the rate constant, you can usually figure out the order. So that's the, the general procedure. We look at ratios of experiments and you know one ratio of experiment, uh, assuming M stays the same. You can even do it with M is not the same, but the math gets more complicated. Uh, if you have two, um, an experiment where you change A, an experiment where you change B, you can cancel out, uh, sol uh, solve for M and N, and then go and get um, what the rate is. Uh, if there's three components involved, well, then you'll need two, uh, you'll need three experiments in order to uh, nail down all the answers. Uh, so but one thing to bear in mind is that frequently the orders like this, but they're not always so clear. In certain circumstances, you can have uh, uh, rate laws that are, that are a little more complicated. For example, an enzyme catalyzed reaction of substrate S to product P, uh, and you can show that in this case, uh, the rate of production, the rate of product is actually equal to uh, this more complicated function proportional to you know, first order, it looks at first, first order in S, but then you divide it by K2 plus S. You get something like this, uh, where at uh, when, um, K2 is quite large, then it's first order. And when K2 is quite small, it becomes zeroth order. And so uh, you'd get, if you just applied that rate law, you do it with this particular situation, you'd get ambiguous results. So you do, um, th this, this method works in many cases, but in some cases where the mechanism is more complex, it doesn't work as well. Okay, so that's the section on rate law. And, and if you take a class in reaction kinetics, you'll dive into this a lot more. All right, so that's the end of the segment on um, being a on, on rate laws and some methods for understanding what the rate law is given some experimental data since you can't figure it out based on the stoichiometry.